minister. Whether you're attending online or in person uh, this morning or sometime later in the week, I'm glad you have chosen to join us for this time of community and of regrounding ourselves and our highest values, uh, which is the uh, meaning uh, from, of the Latin uh, from the word worship, to remember that which is of worth. All, a special welcome to visitors who might be joining us today. This congregation is a community of all ages and abilities. It's a community with a rainbow of gender and sexual identities. It's a community of diverse cultural and class backgrounds. We draw from many different sources of inspiration and share common liberal religious values. Whoever you may be, we invite you to bring your whole self into this space. If you're joining us online, I encourage you to create a YouTube account and be sure and be signed into it when you participate that way. This will allow you to take part in uh, the comments for things like joys and concerns. All are invited to subscribe to our channel and also share videos that you find inspiring with others that you think might be touched by them. <coughs> After the service today, uh, first time guests, regular visitors, and longtime friends are invited to chat with Melissa Gibson. Uh, she's our interim membership and administrative manager. She's hosting a first steps meeting in the Merit Lounge, which is the room with the couches at the end of this hallway. It's an informal meet and greet to uh, discuss the church. You can ask questions about the membership process, learn more about the Unitarian Universalist denomination, um, and just get acquainted a bit. Melissa uh, will meet folks again in the Merritt Lounge, which is down this hallway, about 10 minutes after the service ends, uh, so you have a chance to go downstairs and get a cup of coffee uh, if you'd like to have that with you. I've got a few announcements here. Um, those who use the uh, headsets for hearing assistance here, uh, should you have any difficulty with those, we've gotten a few reports lately and are trying to determine the nature of the problem, please include a note uh, with the headphones when you leave it on the AV desk as to the nature of the problem, give as much detail as you can, and that'll help our techies to troubleshoot and make sure those are working properly for you. And now I'd like to invite forward uh, Beth Conover for a You, You, The Vote announcement. I know, unlike the millions and billions of dollars spent on advertisements, I'm just gonna remind you that if you have an absentee ballot still that you haven't returned, please return it today. Um, it tells you in the paper that they won't count anything after this until Friday. So if you want your vote to be part of the initial counting, you'll wanna return it to uh, the ballot box. It's too late to mail. Um, to the ballot box uh, today, um, the drop box. And I know my problem, I always forget to, rem to sign the back. Um, so sign it just as it has your name there, otherwise it gets kicked back. Um, if you have other questions about it, I found the last page of the ballot to be kind of confusing. <laughs> and so if anyone wants to talk to one of the you the vote, group, um, we have materials around, and then um, we have had a very active committee this year, um, headed by Dave Richardson, Linda Parker, Carol Ramsey, and then the rest of us, Linda Hess, Lynn Thompson, Marie Sedlacek, Elaine Wells, we've all been helping out. I mean, you can sit around and worry, or you can get going and get busy. So um, let me know if you have any questions, or you want to read my version of the World Herald. Um, thank you so much for, I know many of you voted even ahead of me, so. Thank you, Beth. Um, you can also uh, check online if you voted early and <clears throat> confirm that your vote was accepted. I just did that yesterday and it was pretty easy. Um, one other thing related to voting, uh, if you happen to, to see on the church Facebook page this morning a little reminder to get out to the polls and vote, don't take that too literally. It was scheduled to be posted on Tuesday and for some reason, little glitch on Facebook, it popped up today. So the polls are not open today. Go on Tuesday if you're planning to vote in person. 
Last thing I'll mention related to the election is that uh, this Thursday, uh, here in the sanctuary, I'm hosting a post-election um, sharing circle uh, for anybody who's got feelings, whatever they might be, or if we're feeling anxious because we don't quite know everything yet, um, you can come circle up with us here in the sanctuary uh, for some time of sharing with one another a few songs, uh, just a place to, to center and be together. That'll be at 6.30 on Thursday. Our church occupies the traditional treaty lands of the Omaha and Oto Missouri tribal nations whose sovereignty existed long before the state of Nebraska. We express our respect as well to the Ponca, Winnebago, and Santee Sioux tribes, all of Nebraska, and many others that are present in the Omaha area. Our aspiration is to keep educating ourselves and keep supporting causes, charities, and rights that benefit indigenous peoples in our area. And now, let us worship together. This time I invite forward uh, one of the leaders of our UU the Vote team, Dave Richardson, to light the flaming chalice. Will you join me in our chalice lighting words? Spark of the spirit, cupped in earth's embrace, light of love, alive of all creation. As we kindle this flame, we rekindle our connection to the sacred web of life. Thank you, Dave, and thank you to everyone who's been getting out the vote. In times of darkness, we stumble toward the tiny flame. In times of cold, we seek the warming fire. In times of repression, we reach for the lamp of truth. In times of loss, we pray for the comforting light. In times of joy, we light a candle of celebration. Spirit of life, as we worship in the light of this chalice this morning, Help us to find what we need this day. I invite you to rise if that feels good in your body and join in singing our opening hymn. It's in the Teal Hymnal, number 1003, Where Do We Come From? Uh, each line of it repeats. What we're going to do is we're going to sing it all the way through together as a whole group once, and then we'll split into 
two parts, and um, the side on the piano can follow William Miller and continue on through, and the side over here with me on the organ will hold off a little bit and then, and then come in for the round. 10.03. Each week, we practice one of our values, generosity, through a community offering. Half of the loose currency in the offering plate is donated to a cause with a local presence, which advances important principles of Unitarian Universalism. November's recipient is Youth Emergency Services, also known as YES. YES serves homeless and at-risk youth by providing critically needed resources that empower them to become self-sufficient. You can learn more at www.yesomaha.org. Thank you for your generosity.
we come to a time for sharing of joys and concerns. When we share our joys, others can be buoyed with us. And when we share those challenges we face, our community can support us in moving through those difficulties. What have we got, Colin? When you're here in the sanctuary, you can always use the notebook at the back to write a joy or concern. From Linda Hureska, saying a big thank you to Sarah Copeland and Jessica Iman for taking the challenge um, of the heart and hand auction. You nailed it. From From Patricia Pyatt saying, uh, my closest friend who is more like family to me is losing a beloved family member to colon cancer. I would like to remind my church family not to skip colonoscopies. Let's not lose more people with this dreadful illness. And from Kindness Brian saying, I got sliced by a safety knife last Monday and had to get five stitches to my thumb. As we hold in the heart of this community, uh, all of those folks just mentioned and, and others who may be facing illness or challenges, uh, will you sing with me? Comfort me, it's number 1002 and the verses are there on the slide. On the wings of this music, I invite you into a time of contemplation. You may want to be sure you're comfortable in your seat, perhaps rest your eyes. After a common prayer, we'll hold a time of shared silence for your own meditation or personal prayer. And I'll end that silent time with the sound of the bell. First, a common prayer. We gather here in the presence of one another and in the name of all that is sacred, whether we call it goodness or God or simply love. Many here have labored in recent weeks to advance the common good. We have tended friends children, elders. We have carried out our usual vocations with as much presence and care as we can. And so many within the sound of my voice have worked earnestly also for the cause of democracy. Stuffing mailings, knocking on doors, registering voters, voting early ourselves, or doing our civic homework and preparation for Tuesday's
precious ballot. Some are readying to work the polls here in this very building and well beyond. We carry out these tasks that so many before us have faithfully performed. Those ancestors loyal to a government of the people, by the people, and for all the people. Be they in the lineage of our families, our nation, our religion, or this very church, they accompany us now. May we take solace and inspiration in their determined examples. And let us trust that this chain of champions for democracy will go on without end. Yes, people of principle will always take on principalities. Eternal one beyond all names, in this time when the stakes feel so high, remind us to care for ourselves, to keep building community, and to play the long game, no matter what happens this week or this year. May the love that propels us forward burn bright in our being, bringing succor when we are tired, companionship when we feel alone, hope when we are discouraged, and renewal of that spirit of commitment and resilience and resistance that drives our work for a better world. May it be so. Amen. Time of silence for your own centering.
Are you in the middle of a challenge, a decision, or a particular transition in your life? I wonder where you'd find comfort when you were going through something. We are all, as a country, and as an ecological world community, going through some things right now. We Americans are in the middle of a time that, to many, feels fraught, uncertain, precarious. Ronald Knapp, emeritus minister of this congregation, now of blessed memory, found comfort in poetry. When I have sorrowed, Reverend Knapp wrote, poems brought solace. When I have despaired, they brought hope. I'd like to share with you one of Reverend Knapp's own poems, which seems to me to speak to this tumultuous moment. It's called, To Know a Storm. The lake is calm, peace reigns, the air is still, silence shouts, all is quiet serenity. But only for a moment, all is but prelude to the storm. A gentle breeze gathers, the lake becomes restless and anxious. Clouds begin to move across the sky. With quickening steps, they move toward their destiny. They gather momentum, and the sky turns black, shrouding the world in its blackness. The anxiety of the lake intensifies. The gentle breezes become firm winds, pushing and shoving as if to defy those who will not stand in awe. A gentle rain begins to fall, but driven to frenzy by wind, it attacks with piercing delight. Lightning breaks out across the sky, and a thousand shimmering fingers illumine the whiteness of the waves as they roll relentlessly toward the shore. A moment passes, and an explosion, like a thousand drums beating in unison, as if to trumpet the omnipotence of some deity, rips through the dark and awesome sky. In rapid succession, the panorama repeats itself with the accompaniment rising to a crescendo. And then suddenly, almost impulsively, it is over. The storm has passed. Peace once again reigns, and silence once again shouts. Standing upon my hill, I have known the storm. Its shroud of blackness has embraced me. The fierceness of the wind has pushed and shoved against my body. Rain, with piercing intensity, has stabbed its way into my soul. The shimmering fingers of lightning have illumined my spirit. The roll of thundering trumpets has spoken to the turbulent depths of my being. Standing upon my hill, I have known the storm, and the storm, the storm has known me. Each has touched and felt and loved the other. To know a storm, you must live a storm. To know a storm, you must love a storm. Reading this poem of Reverend Knapp's, taking it into my senses and my spirit, I feel I am having a similar experience now. Not of a literal storm, but of a social, political, existential storm sweeping over our nation and beyond. Forces of enormous power are playing out, long gathering, and playing out as rhythmic as thunder and as startling at times as lightning. Only this storm is not over yet, and I'm not sure if it will be for some time. Reverend Knapp's poem invites me to ponder a series of questions. How can I not only know this storm, witness it, but how can I make it through? Can I even love this storm? 
not the very real dangers posed to many people and to our liberties, of course, but can I love the process of doing my best, of giving what I have to give in the midst of this great pressure and cacophony? Can I even experience joy as the lightning zigzags down and the thunder roars? Perhaps joy seems a stretch. Perhaps a story will help. When my daughter was little, she received as a gift a book called The Piggy in the Puddle by Charlotte Pomerantz. The story was dear to my daughter, an only child, because it came from a family friend who was part babysitter, part adopted big sister. Mandy had loved this book, so giving it to Avenel was a sign of her affection. We both loved the book because of its fun wordplay. I'm gonna share the first couple of pages with you. On page one, we see an illustration of a piglet up to her shoulders in a big mud puddle. She's got a pink balloon and a bucket to play in the mud with, and she wears a yellow bonnet and looks quite content. The text goes, see the piggy, see the puddle, see the muddy little puddle, see the piggy in the middle of the muddy little puddle. See her doddle, see her diddle, in the muddy, muddy middle. See her waddle, plump and little, in the very merry middle. A happy scene, indeed. On the next page, Papa Pig stands on his bath in his bathroom on a soapbox. He's got a bar of soap in hand, and he's next to the mud puddle, a very grave expression on his face. He's got a, got a serious hat, too. The text goes, See her daddy, fuddy-duddy, fuddy-duddy, fuddy-duddy. Don't you get all muddy, 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 muddy. You are much too plump and little to be in the muddy middle. Mud is squishy, mud is squashy, mud is oh so squishy-squashy. What you need is lots of soap. But the piggy answered, squishy-squashy, squishy-squashy, nope. As the story continues, Mama Pig wants Piglet to skedaddle <clears throat> from the mushy, squishy mud. But again, Piggy says, nope. Next to decry the oofy, poofy mud puddle is her brother, who again urges her to use soap. Can you guess what Piggy says to that? Nope. You got it. The family looks on, and they fret for a few more pages, until one after another, they decide the solution to this problem is to hop into the mud puddle. Fortunately, it's a rather large pit of mud. It can accommodate all four pigs. Now, perhaps because her family has joined her in the middle, Piggy seems to feel more open to their suggestion in turn. Squishy, squashy, mushy, squishy, oofy, poofy, indeed, said little Piggy. I think we need some soap. But the other piggies answered, oofy poofy. So they all dove way down dairy and were very, very merry. And thus ends the story. Well, upon repeated readings, and there were many, many readings, I began to love this story for another reason. You see, the piggy in the puddle seems to me a bit like a parable. The members of the family have very different ways of looking at the mud. Initially, they stick to their guns and they just disagree. But then the bigger pigs decide to give it a try the little one's way, and they play in the mud. And the little one responds in turn. Now she's open to soap. They listen to each other, they play together, and all ends well. Perhaps that's one lesson of the parable of the piggy in the puddle. Another might be this. Joy can be found even in the middle of a messy situation. All it takes is a playful spirit and willingness to let go a little bit. The reality is, we're always in the middle of something. Except at our birth and our death, we're always in the middle of the story of our own life. 
always in the middle of the unfolding story of our society. Certainly somewhere in the middle of this human story that's been going on now for over 300,000 years. Our interpretation of the story may change a great deal depending on what period of time we choose to look at it. When do we stop and take that snapshot? An old parable from China illustrates this with a tale about a Taoist farmer. This parable is thought to be 23 centuries old. If you've heard it before, I invite you to listen now for how it might speak to any real life story that you are in the middle of right now. There was once an old farmer. He worked his fields, attended his family. The farmer didn't speak much and his neighbors thought he was a simple man. They had a habit of stopping by to voice their opinions on the latest events. One day, the farmer closed the gate to the horse corral, but unbeknownst to him, the latch didn't quite click shut. And before long, the horse nudged the gate open and ran away. Upon hearing of the last horse, the farmer's neighbors came over to view the empty corral. Not without sympathy, the neighbors all said, oh, what bad luck. The farmer replied, hmm, maybe. About a week later, the farmer's horse returned. It brought with it a whole herd of wild horses, which the farmer and his son quickly corralled. Upon learning of this turn of events, the neighbors came to see for themselves this, these wild, beautiful horses. As they stood there looking at the full corral, the neighbors said, oh, what good luck. The farmer replied, hmm, maybe. The following week, the farmer's son was breaking in one of the wild horses when it threw him to the ground and he broke his leg. Guess who stopped by to see the farmer and his family? That's too bad, the neighbors lamented. Such poor luck all over again. Maybe, the farmer said. Now at that time in China, two rival warlords were at war. The warlord of the farmer's village needed more soldiers, so he sent one of his captains to the village to conscript, conscript young men to fight in the war. When the captain came to the farmer's home and visited the son, he found a young man with a broken leg. The youngster was even delirious with fever. So seeing there was no way the son could fight, the captain moved on to another house. Well, a few days later, the son's fever broke. Word spread that the son had been spared from con conscription and was now on the mend. And as you might guess, all the neighbors came to see him. As they stood there looking down upon him, one said, oh, what good luck. Another asserted, it all worked out for the best. The farmer replied, maybe. I invite you to consider now how a challenge, decision, or a phase of life that you are in might look different in light of the farmer's story. So how about this moment in our national story? And if you are feeling like connecting with another person today, uh, we'll take a couple minutes and you might even turn to a neighbor and share with them uh, how you apply this story to your own life.
All right, you may wish to continue that conversation at um, coffee hour. And in fact, I'll sit at a table down there and would love to hear how you apply the story to your life if you care to share. All right, so Ron Knapp and his poem, To Know a Storm, we might look at it as inviting us to live the storm, to be present to all our senses, to be a full witness to the tumult around us. He even invites us to love the storm, to embrace the process as it unfolds. The piggy in the puddle reminds us to relate to those with different viewpoints as still part of our pig or human family, to listen to one another. And the piggy and her family remind us to play, too, to make merry right here in the muddy, muddy middle. And then the Taoist farmer models for us the wisdom of not knowing. We don't know how this is going to unfold, how it's going to turn out immediately or further along. That's OK. Now, if you paid attention to the blurb for this service, you've, you've checked off the pig and the farmer from the list of characters who would appear. Well, here comes the futurist. His name is Peter Layden, and he writes about the great progression from 2025 to 2050. His thesis is that there is, quote, slow-moving pro-progress story, which is being missed by most of the mainstream media who are chasing the minute-by-minute -minute story of crisis and decline. The subtitle on this think piece gives the upshot. The world isn't ending, but we are likely at the beginning of a profound transformation. Leyden describes how a number of different systems in society are all breaking down simultaneously, while new systems are just beginning to emerge, though they don't get as much attention in the news cycle. Let's focus this morning uh, just on the politics side of things. Leyden writes of how over the whole arc of American history, US history, the pendulum swings back and forth between conservative eras and progressive eras. A similar pattern shows up in other Western democracies, too. You could view each side of the pendulum as serving a necessary function for society. That's how he looks at it. Progressive eras tend to emerge when the old ways aren't working anymore. And society needs risk-taking, experimentation, effective government, and sharing power with people who were left out before. Conservative eras, in contrast, bring stability. They go back to basics and consolidate changes that have started. In the transition phase between eras, voters are split close to 50-50 over these two approaches. And the result is extreme political polarization and government paralysis. Sound familiar? Leyden argues that the U.S. has been in this transition phase for about a decade now. He sees the 2020 election as the turning point toward the start of a new progressive era, although it may take several more election cycles to shake out. And pendulum swings tend to bring with them shifts within the coalitions that make up the progressive and conservative groups. There's some dynamics there of who's kind of sliding across from one to the other, as well as shifts in the paradigms that are guiding those two large bodies of people. Polling seems to back up that such a shift is underway, and I'm not talking about presidential or election-related election polls, but issue polls. Uh, quoting Leiden, a solid 60% or often 70% or more of Americans now say in polls that they want to see progress, serious change, in many different areas. They want progress on climate change, not climate denial. Progress on income inequality, not just the freedom to get rich. Progress on gender equality, and now protection of abortion rights. Progress on racial issues. Progress on gun violence. Leyden continues, they also want progress on the affordability of housing and education and health care for everyone. They want effective government that can get big things done. They want their democracy to work with everyone able to vote. I 
found that encouraging. It doesn't mean that such a shift is inevitable, at least I don't <laughs> take it to mean that such a shift is inevitable. I don't know about you, but in my worldview or theology, um, it takes our hearts, our hands, our minds, our ingenuity, our boots on the ground to actually make something like that real. So that's one caveat. Keep, do vote. <laughs> if you haven't already voted, please vote. Another caveat, this one from the futurist, is that these transition periods, particularly the ones leading into periods of transformation versus stability, can be bumpy. Historically, Leiden writes, they can be culturally painful and even devolve into sporadic violence. That was true in the 1850s and the 1930s, two previous transitions into new progressive eras. We've already seen it in our transition period, including, of course, the January 6th insurrection that followed the last presidential election cycle. I believe we will get through this. And we will do it by continuing to put into practice the kinds of values that Unitarian Universalists have long embraced as core religious principles. Values like love and justice. Practices like dialogue and democracy. Realities of interdependence and mutuality. We know that everyone matters. Everyone has something to contribute. And we know that we are stronger together. So, no matter how soon we know or how long it is until we know the outcomes of this 2024 election cycle, and even regardless of what those immediate outcomes are, our path forward is much the same. We will stay grounded in our values with love, the bedrock, we will keep coming together in community, building hubs of courage and resilience. We will keep doing the work of democracy. And as we move through this transition phase, through this muddy, muddy middle and on into a new era, we can continue to play and be merry. May it be so, amen. I invite you to rise for our closing hymn number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath. May we keep saying yes to life, to truth, to love. May we weather the storms in the muddy, muddy middle as we care for ourselves and one another. And let us continue 
both to do the work of building the common good and remember to play. So may it be. Amen.